Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. For those of you who are joining us in the session, for those of you who are uh, going to be watching this in the future, uh, hoping that uh, this session finds you well. Alhamdulillah, we are at the end. Uh, it seems like it's just sped by of this 10 part series of the life of the Prophet. ﷺ. And again, by no means is this any exhaustive or conclusive series for the life of the Prophet. ﷺ. You can't really cover much in 10 sessions, let alone a, a lifetime. And so it is a continuous thing. But hopefully, we've touched on some elements in this series that uh, can pay for a lesson going forward for each of us and uh, for different ways for each of us in exploring the life of the Prophet ﷺ as we are comfortable and where it meets us. And so last time in our session, we had covered the uh, some of the seminal events of Islam, some of the uh, more closing chapter events. We talked about the conquest of Mecca. We talked about the Battle of Hunayn, the return of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina, as well as the farewell pilgrimage and the farewell hajj of the Prophet ﷺ. And the, uh, we covered the final sermon of the Prophet ﷺ, a very famous sermon that's often quoted, especially in our times today, especially in light of some of the issues our society is facing from racial injustice to gender inequality. Uh, these excerpts are often lifted up uh, as a model to see what Islam was built upon, but also uh, what the Prophet ﷺ had taught. And so just jumping into there today, inshallah, we will uh, conclude the life of the Prophet Sallam going from uh, just recapping a bit of that farewell pilgrimage, because I think that there's so much uh, richness to be discussed in that farewell pilgrimage, but also uh, into the passing of the Prophet Sallam, into the death of the Prophet Sallam, and uh, more so the rest of the session, inshallah, after we cover some of those facts, we'll go into uh, what is called the Shama'il. The Shama'il is kind of the inner characteristics, the personality, the beauty of the Prophet Sallam, some of those intimate details, and we'll focus on his character, his mannerism, so that uh, the hope is that when you leave this session, that when you leave this series, that not only are you aware of some of the basic facts of the Prophet ﷺ, not only are you aware of some of the uh, life events or any of these basic things that we may cover in any other class, but that you also are familiar with the Prophet ﷺ as if he was uh, in your own time, as if he is someone you can conceptualize, because we might not have the Prophet ﷺ with us, but oftentimes you may see the remark made that this person such and such has performed prophetic qualities, that their, their character is great, that their mannerisms are nice. We, we know people like this who are there. And now we're going to conceptualize the Prophet ﷺ as that person uh, based on the reports that are there. So based on the Shama'il that are, that are related. And so, as I mentioned, we'll dive into uh, leaving off where we are starting where we had left off with the farewell pilgrimage and then transitioning, inshallah, to uh, the remainder of the life of the Prophet ﷺ after that. And then afterwards, Words, we'll cover these intimate details, these characteristics that had come up, just a few of them there. So, Bismillah, let us go ahead and start. As we had mentioned, the farewell pilgrimage of the Prophet was uh, the one and only Hajj that the Prophet had made. And so, uh, a lot of the, the fiqh that is derived, the jurisprudence, the rulings around Hajj uh, are surrounded on the, uh, are, are kind of centered on this experience. So, different reports of what the Prophet had did. Uh, this was what uh, uh, is the source of material for that. He had done it once, and so uh, any report that comes from there uh, is often seen as authoritative for what Hajj is supposed to be like, the rights of Hajj, what are you supposed to do, what are you not supposed to do, all these different things. But we mentioned that the Hajj had occurred uh, 10 years after the migration to Medina. So just thinking about in the back of your mind as well, how recent it is still uh, the exile of the Prophet ﷺ is, the persecution of the Prophet ﷺ was, how, how recent that was. It wasn't that it was almost multiple decades over. It was, you know, just 10, 15 years earlier that he was experiencing this. And 10 years is in the stretch of time, not a long time at all, uh, especially within our own lives. When we think about what happened 10 years ago, it's actually not too far away. It's not something too distant. It's something that we still generally remember. Uh, within our collective memory. So, but it is within the 23rd year of the revelation. So the Prophet ﷺ has been, uh, has been uh, serving and has been 
uh, you know, in the role of the prophet for quite some time now. Uh, but you can tell he's spent about 10 years in each in each city. And so he's had a different experience there. But uh, he, he's had a holistic development from uh, being a community on the margins to now coming into Mecca as its undisputed leader of the of the Arabian Peninsula. And so and so we mentioned last time how the Prophet had, uh, you know, brought pilgrims from all over Mecca, you know, estimated 30,000, 50,000, 70,000. There's, there's a high number that's there. Um, and uh, what, what, what was the keynote of this Hajj uh, was the final sermon that, that still resonates with us. So I just want to briefly recap that final sermon one more time before we uh, jump into some of the final actions of the Prophet Sallallahu before his passing. But just to remind uh, us that at that final sermon, the Prophet Sallallahu had made hints of the fact that he would probably not be with the Muslim community come next year. He was making hints that uh, his time was coming to a close. We had talked about this in a earlier khutbah, actually a couple of weeks back, that the Prophet ﷺ had kind of given his community hints that he won't be here for much longer. However, when the time, when the time came for his death, he the, it was still a shock as if it had come unexpectedly. And so we see that in the reactions that are related, but still the Prophet ﷺ opens up telling them that, you know, I'm not sure if I will be with you after this year, but then he emphasizes the importance of sacredness, of not just uh, sacredness of life and property, but the sacredness of each and every Muslim. So uh, we, we know what happens after the Prophet ﷺ passes away. There's uh, a lot of different disputes. And later on in, uh, in Islamic history, even within the lives of the companions, there is bloodshed, there is civil war. And so uh, it's important for us to not be marred by the history that takes place after the Prophet ﷺ had left. It's important to study that, of course, but it's also important to see what the Prophet ﷺ was trying to lift up to everyone before he had left, uh, before he had passed away. And the first thing he lifted up was the importance of each and every one of uh, their lives, their property, and the sacredness of uh, each Muslim's life. And so uh, lifting that up in the subconscious of the Muslims that were there, lifting up the fact to not hurt anyone, to not harm anyone, uh, lifting up the fact of accountability towards God. So the Prophet ﷺ is reinforcing these things that if he is not there, for the Muslims to be cognizant of. And we see that many of the Muslims at later times had been mindful of this and had not participated in any kind of fighting or civil war, or any kind of conflict. But we see also that some of the best Muslims had engaged in that. And so, you know, having to reconcile with with, with their actions later on. We, we also mentioned last time how the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned in his farewell sermon that, uh, you know, Satan lost hope of leading you astray in the big things, talking to the Muslim community, leading you astray in big things, as in, you know, uh, taking up different gods and things like that. But be aware of the small things, the little things. And so now the Prophet ﷺ is making them aware of the trials that will take place, that just because you have conquered, just because you are now the established religion doesn't mean your trial is over. This is just the beginning of the test. And so you might not change or waver in your religion per se, but there's going to be a lot of different thorns along the path. And so be aware of those. The Prophet ﷺ lifts up the needs and the rights of women, uh, and he, he specifically names uh, women and, and giving precedence and giving due diligence and rights to uh, women and to wives over men and vice versa, that your wives have a right over you and men, you have a right over your wives. So establishing this parity that previously didn't exist in the society. Remember that, uh, you know, oftentimes we look at the biography of the Prophet ﷺ, we look at the example of the Prophet ﷺ from our lens here, from our time and our focus point in society, and we're like, why didn't the Prophet ﷺ do more? Why didn't he push more? Why didn't he, you know, go beyond and actually, you know, establish something that maybe we have today that wasn't there at the time? Uh, it's really important to look back at the time that the Prophet ﷺ had come again, just 10 years, just 15 years earlier, you see the different practices that are taking place that are prevalent within the non-Muslim Arabian society in which women aren't really given much property rights with the exception of a few women um, like Khadija who, who may uh, you know marry into a family where, where it actually works out but uh, not having uh, general property rights, divorce rights, other things that uh, really help them mobilize and mobile uh, and move upwards in the social ladder and Prophet by uh, leveling that playing field, 
by establishing and helping to ground things such as basic as divorce rights, as basic as inheritance rights, as basic as general human rights. Um, he establishes a framework for upward mobility, which previously did not exist with the exception of some very rare situations. And so it's very important to see the Prophet ﷺ is not just naming this as a catch-all, but it's very strategic how the Prophet ﷺ is going through the this final sermon, lifting up the dignity for everybody, lifting up accountability to everybody, to treat everybody with no harm, to treat everybody with respect, and to know that Allah is watching. And then immediately from these general lessons, first and foremost, going to those in the community who are who have been often most marginalized. And so lifting up the rights of women, telling the, the companions explicitly to treat women kind and treat them well because they are your partners. So uh, instilling this concept of domestic harmony, because in the previous society, in the previous ways, this might not have been something that was as emphasized. And the evidence of it is clear. We see some tribes previously also engaging in female infanticide. So you see the Prophet have, over the past 23 years having changed the psychology of the people, now giving kind of his magnum opus of a sermon just detailing what are some of those highlights, what are some of the things to hold on to, to hearken to. And so the Prophet ﷺ also recaps the, uh, the, the pillars of Islam, tells the believers to worship Allah, to pray the five daily prayers, to fast during Ramadan, to give in wealth, to give in zakah, to do the hajj again if they can, uh, reminding them, again, going from uh, the marginalized and still staying on that, that all humanity is from Adam and Eve, and that the, uh, the Arabs don't have a superiority over someone who's not Arab, that uh, Blacks don't have a superiority over white and that whites don't have a superiority over blacks and that uh, except any of these differences, except any of these people have a claim to being a uh, being higher or being greater than one another is by piety and good action. Again, we see that the society that was in pre-Islam, the Arabian society at this time, was not just a socially stratified society, it was also a racialized society. We see how people, especially from Abyssinia, especially from Africa, Africa, especially from uh, places where uh, their skin tone was much darker, were treated as uh, unequal. We're treated with uh, second-class citizenship. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, establishing this parity, but also going beyond. We'll see in certain instances uh, in the Prophet ﷺ's life where he elevates people who are of color, and we'll see them uh, in just a moment, but people who are of, uh, of darker complexion, lifting them up to places of leadership, but also not just figuratively, but literally to where people can see that the person who is calling us to prayer, the person who is the voice of uh, calling the Muslim community is a Black man. And so lifting this concept up, uh, so it's easy for us now to maybe share a post on Instagram or a Facebook post that says, oh, the Prophet ﷺ was, uh, you know, teaching us that Islam has none of this, that there is no superiority over uh, white or black or Arab, non-Arab. But we also have to dive into the psychology. What did it mean? Many of the people who had just, who were at this Hajj um, had just accepted Islam recently. These weren't people who were there for the past 23 years. Most of them had had come within the last decade or so. And so it's important that the Prophet ﷺ is reinforcing this because much of it is a fairly new audience. We see the Prophet ﷺ also then go from lifting up the margins to then reinforcing the ties, not so much the exact ties of tribalism, but talking about the ties of Islam, that Muslims are uh, like brothers and sisters to one another, and ultimately they are one uh, brotherhood, one sisterhood. And again, uh, reinforces to the Muslims that they will be accountable to Allah, that they'll be accountable to God, that after him, there will be no new faith. And so holding fast to the book of Allah and to the example of the Prophet ﷺ is where the success will lie for the Muslims if they hold to it. <clears throat> And at the conclusion, the Prophet ﷺ lifts up that, have I conveyed my message faithfully? And the, 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 the crowd unanimously shouts that, you know, oh Allah, we bear witness. Yes, you have, that you have. Um, and and it's, it's said that uh, one of the, the final surah uh, of, the, of the Quran was revealed at this time, or at least was, uh, was brought to light that uh, surah Nasr that when Allah's help comes and victory is achieved and when you see the people coming into the faith in 
in droves and in, in, in the way of God in crowds, uh, glorify your Lord and seek Allah's forgiveness for Allah is the acceptor of uh, repentance. Many of us uh, know of this of the surah. It's uh, a, a short surah um, at the end of the Quran, but it's so, it's so powerful that it uh, really caps this crescendo of the Muslim arc, uh, the story of the Prophet Sallallahu towards the very end here. But as we see, the Prophet Sallallahu this was his last major public uh, appearance in the sense that he's probably he's not going to have a crowd of this size again. Uh, we, we talked about over 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 Muslims that are present. Uh, they most of them will not see the Prophet ﷺ again at this time. And so what he states in his final sermon is oftentimes the last thing they might hear from him uh, until they go back to Medina. Some things to lift up that the Prophet ﷺ was not just simply talking the talk as all situations, he also walked that walk. And there's uh, a very significant incident that had occurred, not just uh, for its uh, black and white issues, but also just because you see the Prophet Sallam put into place uh, different things in the uh, into the mindset of this community, which previously they were still wrestling with. So one of the final actions before death, the Prophet Sallam had uh, commissioned a expedition to Syria. Uh, we talked last time how just three years or so earlier, um, the Prophet Sallam had sent a expedition towards the Syrian border led by Zayd ibn Haritha. His uh, his former adopted son uh, to go um, you know uh, to go uh, deal with some uh, some hostile tribes that were at the north of the uh, Arabian Peninsula and the Syrian border and so we we talked about how there was actually um, quite a rout of the Muslim army due to uh, a Confederate or contingency of Byzantine troops or uh, other tr uh, tribes that were there and so you know they were outnumbered they had been routed and there were significant number of casualties of them, uh, Zayd ibn Hatitha. And so three years later, the Prophet ﷺ comes back, uh, and the situation is relatively the same at that uh, at that place. And so as the Prophet ﷺ is wrapping things up, this seems like one of those things that is, uh, is a loose end that needs to be tied. And so the Prophet ﷺ commissions uh, Usama ibn Zayd. Usama ibn Zayd uh, was the son of Zayd who had been martyred three years earlier. But Usama at this time was maybe a young man. Uh, some of the reports have him as a late uh, in, in his late teens, maybe 17, 18. Uh, some of them have him in his early 20s. So regardless, he was a young man. And so uh, the Prophet appoints him as the leader of this expedition. And instantly, he is uh, criticized by some of the more senior people, by other people in the ranks who who, uh, who, who see his leadership, who see him and his age as an impediment that he, where did he, you know, get the, uh, get the, get the right to hold that flag and be the leader. Um, he's just a young kid. He's just, you know, he hasn't had that much experience. What about one of us? And the Prophet Sallam, it's really important that, uh, why the Prophet Sallam defends him is not just from like an action of nepotism, but what we'll see is who Usama was as well. The Prophet Sallam tells them, first off, that you contest his leadership and you oppose his leadership, but uh, you have already contested the leadership of his father. When, when I appointed him, you also had some stuff to say. Uh, and he lifts up praises of uh, Usama, lifts up praises of the son of Zayd, how he is one of the most beloved to him, how his father was of the most beloved to him. So the Prophet ﷺ tells him that, no, this isn't just, you know, just me just throwing it, but there is, there, there's precedent here. And you, you guys have had a hard time kind of dealing with him and his father, uh, even though they are the most beloved to me. <clears throat> And so uh, the Prophet Sallallahu lifts up Osama as the uh, leader, as the general, as um, you know, the, the head of this expedition. But also uh, it shows that the Prophet Sallallahu confirming this choice uh, that neither a man's social or, or a man or a woman's social origin nor their age uh, prevents them from, should prevent them from exerting authority uh, and power if they instead possessed spiritual, intellectual, and moral qualities required. So Osama might not have had the track record of all these different battles or being at many of the battles, because remember, he's just a young kid. So for many of the battles, he was too young to participate. So how uh, would he, you know, how, how is his track record going to compare with someone who's been able to go to all of the battles? But uh, we see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi lift up different aspects of uh, uh, Usama. He, he's known as the beloved of Rasulullah, the beloved of the messenger of God. Uh, and so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi sees something in him that the other people can't see on, uh, on his on his. CV or on his resume, hey, you only have maybe one or few, two battles here. You don't have all
all of this, uh, the Prophet sees beyond that, that it's not always just about your resume. It's not just about your worldly accomplishments. It's also about who you are. But in this, in this lesson, the Prophet also taught his companions not to power grab, to instead be comfortable with delegating authority, to engage also the youth. The Prophet uh, in, in, this, in this kind of uh, final um, you know, action, one of the final actions, has so many lessons packed in because we see now in our communities, we see now uh, in our mosques, oftentimes power is held not just by one group of people, but by, by one demographic, a general age group, uh, age range. Range, and oftentimes youth are left at the margins. Oftentimes certain people are left at the margins, and especially if they're not of the same uh, ethnic origin as maybe the folks who are at the top at the mosque. And so there's a lot of disenfranchisement that occurs. And the Prophet ﷺ is teaching the Muslims at this time that it's okay to pass on the torch to other people. It's okay to engage other people because they might not have the all the literal experience, but if they are good people in heart, if they are sincere, uh, and if they are um, you know, genuine in their in their intentions, they should be given that opportunity. And what's even more important is that uh, if we recall, Osama was the son of Zaid. Osama was the son of Zaid and Umm Ayman. If we recall who Umm Ayman was, Umm Ayman was uh, the prophet's um, kind of caretaker. She was the servant of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, and she was an Abyssinian slave. Uh, Zayd ibn Haritha was a uh, Yemeni slave who had been who had been freed. So now, just think also the complexion of Osama is one that is very dark. Uh, he's he's very close to uh, what we might call black. Uh, and so we also see in this in this aspect where uh, the Prophet Sallam has throughout his prophethood had to deal with not just non-Muslims but companions who will curse other companions or make fun of other companions because of their uh, uh, their racial complexion or their their color of their skin. We see how Bilal was uh, was ridiculed by a companion as the uh, a son of a black man, and the Prophet ﷺ had uh, had criticized had uh, had uh, corrected that companion for uh, for even you know lashing out for even saying something like for invoking the person's mom, but also for uh, bringing up this element. And the Prophet ﷺ reprimanded him, saying that you know you you are still in jahiliya, that you you still have that which Islam came to take away. And so you see the Prophet ﷺ also doing this aspect in bringing someone who's not like the other people, who doesn't look like the majority of the other people, who is literally on the margins um, just from the social ladder here. He might be beloved by uh, Rasulullah. He might be loved by the Prophet ﷺ, but still because of his complexion, he will face other barriers that other people that, uh, that don't have his skin complexion, that don't have his background of being the son of two former slaves uh, has. And so you see that this is a society still wrestling with lineage and still wrestling with um, you know the, these things of jahiliya that are that are still prevalent to this day. And at that time, the Prophet says, "This is your leader. This is your commander. He's going to take you in the battlefield." He's only 19 to 20, 18, 20, whatever he is, um, but he's also uh, someone who's black. He's someone who's a darker complexion than you. Uh, and by the way, he uh, he's one of the most beloved people to me, and he's going to be your leader. So you see that some of the criticisms that probably came towards uh, Osama were probably not just because of his age. There's also uh, this uh, ethno supremacism that uh, this ethnocentricism that 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 is taking place. And so we also, uh, before we close out on Osama, it's very important to lift up that Osama. I believe if we had discussed it in the previous sessions or not, uh, Osama had uh, on a previous expedition earlier uh, had gone out um, with an army, and uh, if we recall, he had uh, you know been fighting with uh, this this combatant and the combatant threw down his weapon and sat, uh, you know, threw his hands up and professed that uh, I bear witness that there is no God, but God and Muhammad is a messenger. He says the Shahada essentially becomes a Muslim at the time. And Osama says, I, I see exactly what you're doing. You know, think about each of us would probably think the exact same thing when someone uh, is on, is just trying to save their life. And so he's like, I see exactly what you're doing. You're just trying to save your life uh, so that you can, you know, get out of here and uh, live another day. Um, and so Osama cuts him down. Osama kills the man at that moment. And word of this reaches the Prophet Sallallahu and when uh, Usama then goes uh, to meet the Prophet Sallallahu uh, the Prophet Sallallahu is quite heartbroken and quite upset uh, when when Usama tells him about this. And he he says very simply and very powerfully that 
uh, he said the Shahada, right, Osama? He was like, yeah, he said it, but he was just saying it to get out. He was just saying it to survive. And he said that Osama, he's like, what, like, you know, did you know what was in his heart? Were you, did you know what was written in his heart when you killed him? Did you know that he may have truly had become a Muslim? And he said, and he even further, you know, reprimanded him and said, Osama, what will you do on the day of judgment when that person's Shahada bears witness against you? very strong you know uh, reprimand from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. again this is like his this is this is like his grandson this is you know not his biological grandson but this was someone known as the beloved of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, very beloved but you see the degree of reprimand the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had given him but then also you see that uh, Osama had said at that time that that was like such a, a scathing you know comment and such a, a harrowing remark by the prophet so some that i wish i had just become a muslim the day before uh because it would have been a forgivable mistake that he didn't know any better but uh osama later on is now that person that the prophet so some gives command to because it shows us that our mistakes no matter how severe no matter how um you know how uh, bad they might get if we approach them sincerely with repentance they don't define us the prophet so some could have been like, hey, this Osama has a bit of a hot head. He's a bit of a loose cannon. I don't know if I can trust him at the head of a whole, whole army. Uh, you see what he did just a few years ago. And the Prophet ﷺ being able to look past people's faults like he did for so many of the companions to look past their faults and see that their mistakes don't define them. And so in our society today, we oftentimes count how many chances do people get? How many uh, things do people get before they're bad or before they're good? We quantify these things and systems are built on this that, hey, how many crimes do you commit before you are forever put away for a certain time? And so it's important for us to look back and see how the Prophet ﷺ took one of the most severe uh, instances of trans transgressions across in, in, in a situation of battle, um, taking the life of a Muslim, albeit someone who just had professed it at the moment, but uh, the severity of that, but yet still the Prophet Sallallahu being able to lift this back up. So when we think about the criticisms against Osama, think about this as well. Some of those people may have been with him on that expedition, seen what he had done. So they might not have seen a racial component or maybe just the age component. They might've just seen that, hey, this person had cut someone down who uh, had professed they were Muslim. So there's probably other concerns. And the Prophet ﷺ going to the extent to say that that doesn't define who you are if you approach that with a sincere, spiritual, intellectual, moral type of uh, a um, type of forgiveness, a, a, a type of repentance that, that's there. And so that goes for, for Osama. So this is just, like I said, there's so many other incidents that, that we can share that are like this, but this is one to lift up uh, the, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu especially in this time and the actions he was taking that don't just have an impact on that time or for that expedition, but for us, as we are living in a society that is highly uh, divided, that is highly stratified, racialized, and how to navigate this when we are often put into different corners. Now, towards the final days, the Prophet Sallallahu was visiting uh, the graveyard, uh, Baqi al-Gharqat, next to the masjid, next to the mosque in Medina. Um, and so he had one time, just a, just a quick side note, uh, we talked about how the Prophet Sallallahu on a uh, separate kind of expedition was uh, returning back. Uh, and he had you know, stopped the caravan uh, to Medina and he had stopped the caravan and he had just kind of gone out uh, in the middle of nowhere at this time, it's kind of dark. And so the companions start to wonder where, you know, where'd the prophet go? And so they start to hear this loud kind of like this, this crying, they start to hear uh, someone weeping. And so they run to the, this abandoned, this kind of, you know, uh, dark area. Uh, and they see the Prophet is uh, just on his knees and, and he's just sitting there. And so they think something has happened. They're like, Prophet what, what, what is, what's wrong? Um, and he tells them that this is the grave of his mother. Almost 50 years later, he said, this is where my mother is buried. Um, basically that, that I miss her. Uh, and he says that previously I had prohibited you from visiting the graves um, as it may, you know, just, just as uh, at that time, previously I, I had restricted you or prohibited you, advised you not to visit the graves, uh, but um, you should go visit the graves for they are a reminder of uh, death. They are a reminder of the hereafter. They're a reminder of the life uh, that is to come. So they serve as very powerful reminders. And when they saw the Prophet of crying, they all themselves uh, being as connected as they were also started to cry. It wasn't their mom, but by seeing the Prophet Sallam in such pain, uh, seeing him in such a sort of grief. Remember, he's he's over 50 years old. He was six years old when his mother had passed. Uh, and he's just sitting there 
still remembering the, uh, where his mom passed away, still remembering she, where she was, keeping that connection, but for a purpose that benefits us all today. So at the end of his life, we see him going to the graveyard frequently, where some of the most closest companions are buried, where his daughters are buried, where his son is buried, where his uh, two of his wives, uh, or actually one of his wives uh, are buried. And so we see uh, how the Prophet has not just a connection to the people who are there, but also uh, he goes there and he, he his lesson is that he is reminded of the hereafter. He is reminded of what is to come, but also going to the graveyard to pay respects to those companions whom he uh, hopes to meet soon, whom he will see soon. And so uh, a companion is with him at the time by the name of Abu Mu'ayhiba. Abu Mu'ayhiba uh, is with him and the Prophet has uh, informs him again when he see that the Prophet is dropping these kind of hints that, uh, hey, you know, my time's coming to an end. You see how people are, it just goes over people's head. Like they're, 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 they're completely missing it because it's, it's just outside of the realm of possibility for them that uh, someone as focal as the Prophet Sallam, the person who's the bedrock of the city, the bedrock of Islam is going to leave. And so Abu Muayhiba uh, is told that uh, the Prophet Sallam says, uh, I've been offered the keys of this world and basically eternal life followed by paradise, um, or I have the chance to uh, meet my Lord. Uh, uh, and, you know, which, which do you think I should choose? And he was like, oh, Prophet Sallam, stay with us forever. He was like, you know, just uh, take the keys of this world, um, you know, be with us forever. Uh, that would be best. And uh, the Prophet Sallam says, I've already made my choice. And my choice is uh, to meet my to meet my Lord. Um, and, you know, he, Obu Muhayba, Muhayba may have gotten it, may have not, but, you know, doesn't seem to have sent any alarms ringing off. But it's it's also that, oh, man, like, you know, you're kind of sad, but it's, it's just something that's said. And so uh, we see later on as well, the Prophet at different gatherings in the mosque hints at his passing. He hints at his passing to the congregation, to his followers and community, but they still don't believe him. Um, at one incident, only Abu Bakr gets a, gets a, you know, gets a, catches his drift and sees what he's saying and starts to starts to weep. And so the Prophet ﷺ lifts up Abu Bakr as, uh, in his character and in his sincerity. So Abu Bakr and some of the more closer companions and family of the Prophet ﷺ were probably the ones who were like knowing what what is going to happen. But um, you know, we see. As the Prophet uh, goes on, his condition starts to cripple. Uh, he he d gets a very uh, strong series of headaches, some migraines, uh, and his condition progressively deteriorates. Uh, he eventually can't stand for prayer. Uh, there's some incidents where the Prophet has the companions pray sitting sitting behind him. That because he's not able to stand, they can they can sit down as well. And he has uh, a, a desire to spend his final days with uh, his wife Aisha. So when he spends his final days with his wife Aisha, this doesn't mean that nobody else is allowed to visit. We see family, uh, we see companions coming to visit, and there's one very powerful incident in which the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu his last surviving child, we talked about how uh, five of his six children had passed away, and Fatima was the only one to uh, outlive her father. So just thinking about uh, the significance of that, we probably can't really get over how, how, how significant um, this was for the Prophet Sallallahu uh, but also for Fatima, for seeing her siblings pass away, uh, but also for a, a, a parent to have to bury their child, uh, not one, but uh, over five times. And so Fatima uh, comes to visit the Prophet Sallallahu and uh, Aisha is there and she sees the Prophet Sallallahu whisper something to Fatima. And at first Fatima starts to tear up, starts to cry. And then the Prophet Sallallahu comforts her and says something else else to her and then she starts to laugh and later on down the line uh Fatima tells Aisha because she's curious she's like what did, what did he tell you uh and she said that uh you know this that the illness that he had the um the sickness that he had uh it would he wouldn't be much longer he's going to pass away because of it uh, and so she started to cry but he had told her that uh, the first of my family members who will meet me uh, or who will, who will join me afterwards, after I pass, uh, will be you. And so uh, at this, she had, uh, she, she, she had found joy. And so for us, it might be hard that, oh, he's like, you know, making a premonition of somebody's death or whatnot. But we see the connection of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to each of these people, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, especially to the people of his household, that they weren't just ordinary folks, that he held them in such a high regard um, that Fatima, his daughter, was someone who would come into the house and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would always stand up for her. He would always show her this respect that he's sitting. He wouldn't show this for most of the other companions or any of his other family members, but when she walks in, he would stand up. 
he would stand up and, you know, have her sit where he's sitting and then, you know, give her that full attention, give her that respect that uh, we oftentimes don't see uh, in society when it comes to uh, when it comes to daughters, you know, we, we have an easy time criticizing tribes way back when that would bury their daughters, but we don't talk so much about how daughters are still uh, mistreated and still put on the margins uh, and abused by families that are in Muslim countries. And so we see in this example, the Prophet Sallam has a severe respect for Fatima. He's not, he, he's not, uh, you know, just, just saying something just to make her happy, but he's giving a sincere, um, you know, uh, prophecy in this, in this respect. And Fatima as well reacting as such that she, you can see the, the sadness that is there when she realizes the Prophet Sallam won't be there anymore. But these folks did not live for the dunya. They did not live for the present, the just the worldly matters, especially the family of the Prophet Sallam, especially uh, Ali and Fatima uh, and their family. They didn't just live for this world. They they knew what was the true goal. And so when the Prophet Sallam says, you'll be the first to join me of my family, um, th this, this shows a sincerity of hers in faith and that she's excited about this because uh, that, that gives you something to look forward to, that I will see the Prophet Sallam and hey, before anybody else, it will be me. And so we know uh, Fatima had, had passed away uh, just about six or so months after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had passed away. Um, so she she did uh, indeed of his family was one of the first to was the first to follow him. Um, and then just to the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi because I want to give some time for the Shemaya for the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi So we don't just remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi in death. We see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi character was something that transcends that. Uh, so we know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi had passed away uh, in the year 632. Some folks dated around June, so June 8th or so. Uh, and it was but as more significantly, it was uh, 11 years after the migration. So just thinking about how many years the Prophet ﷺ is in Medina, how many years was he in Mecca? Remember, he was in Mecca, um, you know, as a prophet, uh, in, you know, before a prophet, 40 years uh, after a prophet, you know, almost uh, 11, 12 years, uh, majority of his life is in Mecca. Yet, if you recall, uh, a couple sessions ago, we had uh, we had talked about how the Prophet had uh, had comforted the people of Medina when they had seen how generous he was being with the Meccans. That I'm going to come back with you all. That Medina held such a special place, not just within the tradition of Islam, but for the in the heart of the Prophet that he was willing to go back to Medina, uh, his new home over the place he had lived over 50 years. So there's a lot of significance and a lot of blessing that, that is there in Medina. And you really feel it. If you go to Medina, if you go to Mecca, Mecca is still that kind of trade city that has fast pace. You know, people's mannerisms are very similar to uh, going to a place that's very busy, like a New York City type deal. And Medina has a very tranquil feeling to it. It has a very different feeling to it. Uh, and, and you can see that there, there was an aura about it that whether before or after the Prophet Sallallahu that, that still lasts, that's there. The Prophet Sallallahu uh, in his final days joins the congregation for prayers or tries to, but uh, is, is not fully able to. So there's incidents where he's carried to uh, the, the congregational prayer. Um, there's incidents where uh, the day he passes away, um, he looks out on his congregants, he looks out on the Muslim community, and some of them look back at him. And all they can see is a wide smile. The Prophet Sallallahu is just smiling. Um, we know that you know he was dealing with a very serious fever. That he would have, he would go in and out of consciousness. That he would have to have like buckets of water kind of dumped on him to regain consciousness. Uh, and so he was really struggling with uh, with his with his disease or whatever it was, his illness that was there. Um, and but one of the last images the Muslims see of their Prophet is one in which he's smiling. And one of the last things the Prophet does to his community before he parts from them is smile upon them, that he is pleased with them. Um, and so seeing them all praying together, it wasn't that they were all just, you know, having a grand old time, they were all praying together. And this made the Prophet Sallallahu happy. Uh, this was one of the final sights that he would see on his community. And this was the last time most of them would see him. And so uh, he's back in Aisha's home. He's sitting at the lap of Aisha, just sitting uh, with his head to her chest. Um, and, you know, he, he's, he's, in the, he's in the throes of death. And he 
he feels it. It's not that the Prophet uh, was someone who was exempted from the pangs of death because the Prophet lifted this up uh, even as he was passing away that death is indeed a very severe um, you know, trial or ordeal. And that you know, he, he himself was having to go through this. But his final words kept being, uh, you know, oh Allah with supreme communion, with, with the best friendship, that Arafika al-Ala, that the, the highest friend, the best friend. Uh, and he kept on uttering this. Um, and the Prophet Sallam were being, you know, we'll talk about this in the Shamail that uh, hit the remembrance of Allah never left his lips. And one of the traditions of the Prophet Sallam was that, uh, you know, the, every everything has a polish and the polish of the heart is the remembrance of Allah and we see the Prophet Sallam continuing to do this we'll talk about this in his prayer why he would do this like he's the Prophet Sallam he's someone who's guaranteed uh, paradise he's someone who's been forgiven already why does he need to go to the extra length to do this and he continues to do this but more importantly as well as he's going through this time as he's going through his pangs um, he also does not lose his sense of humor he doesn't lose who he is and just center everything on him and so uh, he you know is having this severe headache at this time and his wife Aisha is like, I'm also having a headache. She's like, my head. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has a light joke with her, telling her that, um, you know, uh, you w- wouldn't you be happy, Aisha, if that, uh, you know, if you if 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 your headache um, was like mine, uh, and this was just the this was the end of it, uh, that you would that no one else would pray your janazah except for me. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would pray your janazah, would give you the proper and best rights, uh, and you would be taken care of uh, in that respect. And she says, you would like that, wouldn't you? Because then you know, you will just uh, go off with your other wives. And so, you know, they have this light joking that they have, but still at, the, at some of the most tender moments. Uh, but uh, we see how uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's interactions with his family, his sense of humor had existed there. The, these incidents give us an insight to what life was like with the Prophet ﷺ before and even at the most tender moments at keeping things light, uh, even in such a tense moment as this. Eventually, uh, as we know, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, had passed away in Aisha's arms, uh, in her arms, he had passed away. Um, and uh it you know just it's it's a it's a scene to be seen. Someone uh, there there is a um, a tradition that that recalls that on the day the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi entered Medina, the city was engulfed in light. Uh, you know the name of Medina, Medina Al Munawwara, the 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 lit up city. Um, and on the day that he passed away, the entire city was enveloped in darkness. And uh, we, we, we know of so many different reactions that are taking place. But uh, we talked about this in an earlier khutbah. What why this was a significant passing. We'll come to that in a second. But uh, of the most significant reactions taking place was of Omar. Uh, Omar had uh, come to the mosque hearing that the Prophet ﷺ had passed and could not believe it, was quite hysterical, quite angry and livid that anybody could even think that the Prophet ﷺ would die or the Prophet ﷺ would leave. And he threatens to kill anyone who says that the Prophet ﷺ is dead uh, because the Prophet ﷺ has only left in spirit. He'll be back. It's, this isn't the end of the story. And so as uh, you know, Omar is, 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 is kind of just like uh, in a panic and, and a, in a frenzy, you know, admonishing people who are weeping and who are saying the prophet's dead, Abu Bakr also arrives, goes to the house of Aisha, sees the Prophet Sallam has passed away, um, you know, just uh, kisses his forehead, uh, tells him that just as in life he was beautiful, in death he was also beautiful. And she says some other uh, really personal and intimate words uh, showing the, the the bond that the two had. Uh, and then he comes out. You know, this is this is Abu Bakr. When we compare him to Omar, Abu Bakr is often seen as someone who's very uh, quiet. He's very reserved. He's soft-spoken. And Omar is the one with the loud voice, the big personality, the uh, kind of the uh, brawn. And so Abu Bakr comes out and tells Omar to be gentle. He's like, hey, calm down, calm down. Omar is still not having it. He's, he's still like, no, th- these people are going crazy and I need to discipline them. And then finally, Abu Bakr lifts his voice and says uh, to the crowd that says, uh, let the one who worships Muhammad Sallallahu know that Muhammad Sallallahu is dead. Very powerful, just says it point blank. But let them know that they who worship Allah, for them, Allah is ever living and Allah never dies. In one sentence, the, uh, Abu Bakr sums up what needs to be said because there's a lot of confusion. People are crying. Omar is in the corner here, you know, shouting all these different things. And so we don't know what to believe, uh, what, what is going on. And Abu Bakr very simply closes the matter at that. But also because for those who still 
had doubt. For those who still couldn't believe it, uh, he recites a uh, verse from Surah Ali Imran, which was revealed at the Battle of Uhud. If you recall in our sessions at the Battle of Uhud, we talked about how the Prophet ﷺ was near, was very close to death, essentially, that uh, he, he had been injured to such an extent that the uh, rumor had spread that the Prophet ﷺ has been killed. And so many people dropped their armor where they were. Many people had just stopped what they were doing. They were, they were in a state of shock. Uh, and the uh, verse reads that Muhammad is no more than a messenger, that uh, there were messengers who passed away before him. And if he is, uh, if he dies, or if he is killed, would you turn and run away from your faith? Anyone who runs away does no harm to Allah in the least, and Allah will quickly reward those who serve uh, Allah in gratitude. And then Omar uh, relates that when he heard this verse being recited, even though it was one of the earlier verses in Islam, he felt that this was the first time he had ever heard this verse and he had just kind of broken down. Um, the companions later related uh, after the death of the Prophet that there was no greater musibah, there was no greater difficulty to us that we had to bear than the death of the Prophet And this is something that the Prophet himself lifted up to, that uh, his death in and of itself was... Uh, one of the most major trials for his community. Um, you see that this pain was felt for the Prophet ﷺ holistically, not just because he was a religious leader, not just because he was a Prophet ﷺ. We talked about this, that he was someone uh, in each of this crowd. He's connected to Abu Bakr and Omar, just for instance. He is not just a close friend of them, but he is also someone who is uh, their, you know, he, he is their son-in-law. He is married to their daughters. But to all the people that were sitting in the mosque, to, to the city that, that wept for him, he was a neighbor at the least. He was a friend. He was someone who was a husband to some. He was a prophet to all. He was a caretaker for many. He was an uncle. He was a brother. He was a cousin. He was all these different things. And so everybody who was in that city, who was in that setting that were there, felt that when the Prophet ﷺ was with them, he made them feel like they were the only person that mattered in the world. He, he honored them to such an extent. So just think of someone who gives you such a holistic experience and such a type of uplifting that, uh, you know, when you when he passes, when that person passes, that you don't just lose someone who is uh, just, you know, a figurehead. You lose someone who is an intimate companion to you. And so we see as well that uh, during the burial, uh, the companions come to visit. Uh, we have uh, some reflections that uh, the Prophet uh, one, one of the companions had reflected seeing the Prophet that uh, the Prophet never prevented me from entering upon him. And every time he saw me, he would smile. So think about some of the things that the companions are remembering, some of the things that they are thinking about. Uh, and some of these things are uh, one of the lasting things of how the Prophet treated them. Some of, uh, you know, some of them just being new Muslims, some of them being uh, new to Islam, how the Prophet treated some of them and made them feel that they were the most beloved. And so uh, the Prophet also lifted up in a previous uh, saying that the closest of you to me on that day, referring to uh, the, the end of times, referring to the, uh, the day of judgment and the, the, the time to come after, that those are the ones who are best in character, that I was sent to perfect human character. And so those of you who spend your lives working on your character will be closest to me. And as I mentioned, the, uh, what we'll discuss today is what some of those characteristics were. The Prophet ﷺ didn't just come to establish a political mission, was not just someone who came to reveal a religion and then leave. The Prophet ﷺ was someone whose example and through whose example, other people, uh, their struggles, their successes are a lesson for us to not just see how we can also, you know, have this, this shadow or this, this type of uh, light of, of, uh, of a prophetic model, but also how to be a good friend, how to be a good neighbor, how to be good spouses, how to be good kids, how to be, uh, you know, good caretakers, how to be responsible people who are civically engaged, how to be people who are upholders of truth and justice, all these different things were in the Prophet So uh, just as a final note, we see that Medina at that time and the people of Medina did not just lose a prophet, did not just lose uh, Muhammad uh, as we know the Prophet to be now. They lost someone who was a very intimate companion to them that was almost as much, if not more, to them than their own families, that was closer to them than all of these relationships. Relationships. So think about in our communities, in our societies, someone who is so 
you know, integral, that is so, um, you know, just so key to our society, to our communities. It might be our mosques, it might be society as a whole, but just think of that one person, you might be that person, but just think of that one person that does all this stuff that people know, people have such a high respect for, and people can't imagine what would happen if this person is to be gone. Now, think about that in the context of Islam, in the context of Medina, and the fact that the Prophet was also someone who was taken away. But also think about the reactions that took place. There was room for that hysteria. There's room for that disbelief, but then there's also time and there's also a place for the uh, for for what needs to be said for someone to be able to say that uh, you know the, the the show must go on. That you have Abu Bakr stepping up to the plates. Abu Bakr not being someone who is a statesman, not being someone who's known to be very vocal or loud on the mic or the loudest person in the room. He's one of the more shyer people that are there. He's one of the people who are uh, who who don't choose to be in the center. That this person chose to speak out when he knew that uh, the, the time called for it. And so saying to the other people that, you know, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was just a man and that this faith, this religion will continue even without him because it's, it's about God. God is the one who, uh, whom we worship, not Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and God is ever living. And so it is very important for us to also be able to see that, that we will encounter difficulties. We will experience tremendous loss, some of the most significant loss in our lives of our parents, of our loved ones, uh, of very influential, very key community leaders and so on and so forth. But we also must remember that at the end of the day, that uh, that life that uh, as a whole time does not stop for that person. Recall when the Prophet ﷺ had said that uh, when the companions had said after the death of his, his child, Ibrahim, his only son in Islam had died, uh, there was a solar eclipse. And the companions said, look, like even, even nature is, uh, you know, is, is recognizing the sadness of this day. And the Prophet says, I'm telling them, no, that these are signs of Allah, that the, the, the moon and sun are on their own fixed axes and, you know, they're on their own or orbits and whatnot, uh, that they don't, they don't change for anybody. Uh, and so for us needing to recognize that time and the world doesn't stop for anybody, but that doesn't mean we can't grieve. There was complete permission to grieve. You see so much uh, grief being shared, so many tears being shed over the Prophet's son's life uh, and his death, but you also see that uh, there were there were uh, there was a need to continue. There was a need to keep things going on because prayers are still going to be held. Just because the Prophet ﷺ has passed doesn't mean we stop doing our prayers. Doesn't mean we stop doing any of these things. So someone like Abu Bakr was someone saying, "Hey, we still have to continue on with life as is." So at that, we conclude with the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, I want to be able to dedicate uh, a little bit of time here just to some characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ. So the series is titled, not by any accident, but called the Prophet ﷺ and I. And the uh, closing portion I hope to be able to part with you is that when you leave this series, when you leave this session, you are able to conceptualize the Prophet ﷺ as if he was sitting right in front of you, that you're able to visualize the mannerisms, the characteristics, all these things about the Prophet ﷺ as if the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ was right there. But also, when I say some of these things, when I read some of these tidbits that, that come here, recall you will probably know somebody in your family, in your life, who knows, uh, who, who, who reflects these, who, who has some of these habits. And so uh, that person might come to mind, but now think of that person uh, as uh, the Prophet ﷺ closer to you, that the Prophet ﷺ was this quality and so much more. So for source material, though, we're using um, for this, this Shamail portion, there's a very famous Shamail of At-Tirmidhi. Um, this, this book was produced by the, uh, I believe, Al-Ghazali Institute, the Imam Ghazali Institute, but uh, it's off of the Shamail, uh, the characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ based on uh, Imam At-Tirmidhi. Um, and it goes into very different details about different parts of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. But uh, let's, let's go ahead and let's jump in for the sake of time and also just to run through these. But uh, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, you know, we, we see the Prophet ﷺ was very engaged, not just with his, uh, with his, you know, people that were around him, but for the property that he owned, for the things that belonged to him, something that was as, as simple as a garment. The Prophet ﷺ would offer such a rich supplication on receiving a new shirt or receiving a new garment, uh, tell, praying that, oh, Allah, to you is all praise for having clothed me in this, I ask you if it's good and the good that it was made. Uh, I ask you uh, seek refuge from the evil that it might bring, the evil that it might have. Uh, and so the Prophet with each thing, we see that uh, it wasn't just that 
uh, he purchased something on Black Friday or he had a he had a good deal on something and now he just adds into his wardrobe. But he was connected with each and every single piece of clothing that he owned with any piece of property that he had. Uh, and uh, again, that uh, he you would never find him but mentioning uh, the uh, having the mention of Allah, having the mention of his creator on any aspect. So when he touches uh, books or he touches anything else here that's in his possession, he, he recognizes that it's not just his, it is something that's been given from Allah. So again, someone who's conscious about this. We see also the Prophet ﷺ was not a very wealthy person. The person. He was not wealthy in, at all, in fact, that he was amongst the poorest of his community, despite being at the head of the state, despite being at the uh, head of the table, per se that uh, it was related, he would never uh, in his lifetime eat to his fill, that he was someone who uh, didn't have the type of, you know, one pound uh, of brisket and, uh, you know, a side of co coleslaw and cream corn that we have here in Texas and eat to his full the process. Some would barely have a little bit of meat or bread. Uh, rice wasn't a staple there. So just very small things that, that were there. He would also, as he's eating, have this mention of Allah uh, in, in beginning, in closing, something that is uh, quite related now to this days, but also very mindful of what he's, how he's eating, that it's something that is a very strong privilege. He wouldn't eat reclining. He would, uh, he would make sure to not waste anything. So it's related, he would lick his fingers, that if there's anything there because they're eating with their food, to make sure nothing goes to waste. Uh, but he would also, uh, if he didn't like something that was there, he would just leave it. He wouldn't say like, man, this food is bad. Like, hey, I had something so much better last time. He would be mindful, not criticize food. But if he liked it, he would he would show his expression to it and he would eat it. But if he didn't like it, he wouldn't do what we do and say that, uh, man, this food is terrible. Or, hey, let me go give him a bad Yelp review. Let me go do this or that. Um, he, 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 he simply just didn't, didn't touch it. He didn't, he didn't let any negative thing come out from him. When he walked, he walked with such a purpose that it was not a gait or a strut where, you know, you might see like a Conor McGregor type of walk where, where someone kind of knows that, oh, this person is just like, it's just showing off or whatnot. But he always walked like he had some place to go. He was as if it was urgent. So he, 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 he walked with such a purpose that when people saw him, they're like, oh, he's, he's probably going to go do something. He's, he has a, he's, he's, a, he's a busy person. So it showed that uh, he always had something that was going on. What's more beautiful as well as, as his speaking, that the Prophet would not draw out his speech and would speak in terms that were clear, that were lucid, and he would space out his words. He would talk in a way that people could understand. Everybody who sat with him would be able to remember the words that he that he said. And it's very beautiful of this narration because uh, there, there's another narration of a sahabia, of a female companion who uh, mentioned that she had learned all of Surah Kahf long chapter, Surah Kaf, just by listening to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on Jummah, uh, just by being with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on Jummah, she was able to memorize uh, Surah Kaf just by listening to him. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would also uh, had instructed his companions to speak to people, to speak to people at their level of understanding. Now, remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is someone who is dealing with people who uh, have been kind of like at the aristocracy. He's dealing with people who've been slaves, who've been brought from other countries. He's dealing with people who are Bedouins, who don't have uh, the same mannerisms. He's dealing with people who are emissaries and diplomats, people from all different ways, and he talks to them at their level of understanding. But uh, it was related that the Prophet ﷺ would repeat words and repeat phrases often, that he would repeat a word uh, or a phrase three times for it to be understood. So not, not just that he had to repeat it and just think about what he's going to say next, but he said it for an effect that each thing he would say, not each thing, but uh, the important things that needed to be conveyed, he would relate them multiple times that he wouldn't speak without need. He wasn't someone who would, as we recall in the first or second session, why Khadija had uh, said that I want to marry you. One of the things she said that you don't want to be at the center of attention. You're always just kind of on the side. So you don't seek to be the, uh, the, the main microphone in the room. You don't seek to be the center of attention. You're just someone who's, who, who's on the side there. And we know that he would not speak without need, that he would begin and end his speech by mentioning the name of Allah, the most exalted. His words were some that were distinguished, but they were not too much, nor they were too few, nor were they words that uh, people did not understand at, at that audience. He would, again, tailor his speech, tailor his ways to uh, the level of understanding. And nor was his speech coarse or demeaning. 
We'll talk about his, his humor in a bit as well and how this was influenced, but just think of a very fine speech that not is just like it sounds good or whatnot, but it's delivered with sincerity. <laughs> In terms of mannerisms, it was related that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, the world and its affairs didn't really anger him or concern him. But if truth was transgressed against, nothing would make his uh, anger uh, cool down until he advocately, uh, actively sought justice for it. So you see the Prophet ﷺ was not just someone who's a passerby, who's someone who's like a thoughts and prayers kind of person. If something that truly uh, went against the the limits of justice and, and transgress those limits went on, the Prophet ﷺ made a very strong point to uh, be able to speak out against it or to stand up against it. And we have the famous hadith of, if you see some an injustice, to correct it with your hands, and if not your hands, then your tongue, and if not your tongue, then your heart. Uh, that th this was a, a part and parcel of the Prophet ﷺ's characters. He would point with his whole hand. So sometimes when we have this connotation that if someone points, it's, uh, it, it's kind of a bit of hostile. It's a hostile body language that if I'm pointing to something, uh, there's so many different meanings that are there, but the Prophet some would use his whole hand. He would use his open hand uh, to point to something, uh, and it's a much more inviting gesture. So you see the Prophet is very mindful of how it is. If he's talking to somebody, he's like, hey, yeah, you. Um, you know, it's like, oh my God, did I do something wrong? It already causes them to panic. But if he says, what do you think about this? What about you? Um, so he uses his full hand. Uh, that his laughing was related as a sight to see. Um, one of the companions related, it was as if when he would start to laugh, like genuinely laugh, that as if hailstones, that hail appeared uh, because of how white his teeth were, how, how big and how white his teeth were. But his laughing was primarily in smiles. He was not someone who, you know, just was like a, uh, a Homer Simpson type of like laugh that just like uh, is just out of control. He's someone who would generally smile. But uh, at certain incidents, he would he would laugh to such an extent that his, his whole teeth would be would be visible. Uh, we mentioned that he had lighthearted. He was not someone who was stoic. He was not someone without humor. He was someone who had uh, played with children and, 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 and teased children and just like, you know, have, uh, you know, in, in, in a positive way, had, had a good, um, you know, relationship with his grandchildren, with other kids that were there, but also with grown adults, with companions. There's an incident where uh, a Bedouin man, uh, you know, who was close to the Prophet ﷺ was in the market one day and the Prophet ﷺ, uh, he's shopping for some things. The Prophet ﷺ comes behind him and just kind of holds him back here and says, who will buy this companion of mine? And, uh, you know, the, the man is just like, I had no idea who was trying to sell me in the middle of the day. And I looked back into the Prophet ﷺ, and so I was much relieved. But he told the Prophet ﷺ, he was like, oh, you're not going to get a good price for me. Like, I'm just a Bedouin. Like, I, I won't fetch any good price. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ says, no, like he says, you know, you you are inexpensive. or So you are uh, invaluable in the eyes of uh, Allah. You are very expensive. And he lifts the person up. It's a Bedouin. It's a person who's on the margins, who's just there, you know, for his for his normal business. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ, in his humor doesn't just say that, uh, hey, look at this guy right here, just makes fun of him. Uh, he, he lifts the person up uh, in, 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 his, in his humor. And he, he speaks, the Prophet says that when he did joke, when he does joke, he, uh, because the companions were like, oh, hey, you have a sense of humor too? Like, you know, you, you laugh as well, you tell jokes. And the Prophet has said, yes, I do, but I only speak with truth. So his jokes were those that didn't require to make fun of somebody in, in a sense of demeaning them. It didn't make a, a point to lie about something, to twist the truth, to create a joke. He, he, he created jokes and he said jokes based on what was there. So he, he engaged with them uh, in ways that were not demeaning, but were ways of uplifting. So when we think about the jokes we have with our families, sometimes we're a little bit harsh. Sometimes you know we, we poke a little bit more fun, but uh, we think that the Prophet ﷺ didn't do any of these jokes to expose somebody or to make himself feel better. Uh, he, he had a joke with them because he loved them. Uh, even if they were just strangers on the street, he had a, he had a genuine love for them. Uh, and then later on, he would uplift them just in that in the incident with the Bedouin man, uh, whose name was Zahir. And so uh, we also see in his prayer, uh, this is something that's very powerful, but it tells us, for me personally, it, it feels like it's a testimony to the Prophet ﷺ's uh, truth, in a sense, just because of uh, why it had to be done or why it was done. The hadith, it was a hadith of Aisha, where Aisha said that uh, the Prophet ﷺ would pray so long in the night that his feet would swell. And then when, he, when she asked him that, you take it upon yourself to do this, that even though Allah has forgiven you your past and your future sins, like, why, why, why are you doing this? 
And his simple reply is, shall I not be a faithful, grateful servant? And Aisha, of course, was a wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, you see, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not just someone who dictated all these different things or made a faith for all these people to do, and then he just takes a backseat. He was the foremost in not just praying to where it would take a toll on his body, but in sincerity where people would encounter him often weeping in prayer. You know, many times for us, prayer is just a ritual. We do it, we get in, we get out because our mom told us, our dad told us, we're, we're just supposed to do it. Um, but he had, he was having a genuine conversation. He was weeping in prayer uh, and crying in prayer. And so we see some people in our lives uh, that have this. And so you see that they have a really deep connection to that spiritual activity, but also uh, to their relationship with the divine. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was someone who, despite being able to take the most advantage, as we've seen with some religious leaders, uh, especially of uh, more recent movements um, in the United States, at least, uh, that will exploit people, that will, that will exploit them. Uh, based on their, uh, e uh, their, their economic standing, based on their vulnerabilities, will capitalize off them and do nothing themselves, but uh, order people to do all this stuff uh, for them. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being instead there uh, at the foremost in the time where nobody is going to go into his house and say, hey, what are you doing? In his private quarters, so that later on his wives would relate that he was somebody who would engage in prayer just like this. And so you see, apart from that, uh, he was an emotional person. He wept a lot, uh, not just in death, because we see how he wept at the passing of his son, Ibrahim, at the passing of his daughter, Umm Khultum. But there's relation, there, there's uh, narratives and uh, uh, related incidents where uh, on the telling of a sad story, on the telling of something, the Prophet is, is brought to tears. Um, you know, we saw he was brought to tears when he saw his mother's grave, different things like that. He uh, crying was something that was absolutely within his arsenal of emotions that was within the range of his emotions it wasn't just like oh my god the prophet's crying like uh you know this is something uh, quite exceptional the prophet ﷺ was someone who's frequently cry frequently show emotion um we see his humility as well he had advised his community don't go in excess and praise praising me like uh the christians early christians had done for jesus but say that uh, but i'm a servant of god and just say that instead I, that muhammad وسلم, is a servant of god an Abdullah and a messenger, Rasulullah. Um, and so uh, you see the Prophet ﷺ had this humility. Again, he could have built on uh, these people's uh, faithfulness to him and really built something quite different uh, that, that we might see in other uh, communities or groups or movements uh, in more modern times, but the sincerity was there that don't praise me to that extent. You know, I'm just a servant. I'm just conveying a message. Um, just remember who I'm a servant for. Uh, there's a beautiful incident where uh, the Prophet as, as we had related, he's approachable by anybody. There's an incident of a woman with mental illness. In, in, some, in, some, uh, uh, in some narratives, in some traditions, she has mental illness. In other incidents, she's just you know, uh, a, a woman seeking um, to, to the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And so she comes to the Prophet ﷺ, uh, this woman with mental illness, uh, something is something's going on. She comes to the Prophet ﷺ and she says, uh, I have a need to ask of you. I need to talk to you about something. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ says, go sit on any street, any kind of side here uh, that you wish. Pick the spot, you name the spot, I'll come sit with you and ask her to take him to where, wherever she wants to go sit. And they're going to, uh, he's going to answer her questions right out there or talk to her right there. But the, the commitment the Prophet some had, not just that we see in our society now, it's like, oh, hey, like, you know, uh, it's someone of the opposite gender, like, you know, you need to do this, 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 all this stuff. The Prophet some met someone where they're at. Clearly, this was a woman who was in distress, who was in need, or she may not have uh, been, um, you know, completely well. So you may have had a mental illness. And the Prophet some says, yeah, it's okay, pick out, pick a place where we say now in our times that, uh, yeah, name a place and I'll meet you there. Uh, basically, in that sense, and, and goes with this person, that he was someone that wasn't just concerned about his own family, he visited the sick often, he wept over uh, people who weren't even related to him, he attended funeral processions, uh, even those uh, funeral processions of people who weren't Muslims. There's a famous incident where uh, the funeral procession of a Jewish person goes by and the Prophet stands up as a way of showing respect. Uh, and when his companions are like, hey, that, that person's a Jew. And he responds, he says, was well, that person not a human? And so lifting up that dignity for everybody, even if they weren't on good terms with him, telling his companions as well, 
he has the level, the authority of a king. We remember that uh, people who were coming to visit the Prophet Sallam were uh, relating back to their people that, man, these people really love him. And I've seen uh, this, I haven't seen this kind of love in the courts of the kings of Persia, of uh, Byzantium, of Abyssinia. These people have a completely different level of devotion to him. Yet the Prophet Sallam made a point to tell his companions, don't stand for me. Don't get up for me. Like when they, it's a sign of respect when you go into, uh, uh, when you're in a gathering and like a head of state or somebody comes, you show them respect. You stand up. A keynote speaker comes, you stand up, you do all these things. The process of said, no, don't stand up for me. You know, stay, stay seated. In certain incidences, he would tell people that, hey, arise, that, that, that person's your leader. But in general, for himself, he made a point, don't even stand up for me stay seated. Uh, and, 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 you know, we, we see how the Prophet does that time and time again. Apart from his humility, we see that the Prophet was not just someone who was just a prophet. We had all these different things listed out. One of those things was a family man. Uh, he was someone who was devoted to his family. Uh, his cousin Ali related that he would divide his time into three portions, that part of his time, a third of his day was spent for Allah in private worship, a third of his day was spent for his family, and one third of his day was spent for himself, just for his own uh, private um, uh, matters and just for himself, just your own time. But he divided this last time between himself and people, people who are of the community, that when he would have people over, when there'd be a gathering, he would not be the one that says, hey, make room for me or just like uh, scoot over. That's my chair. I'm the head of the family. Like, you know, this is my chair. Why are you sitting here? He would come and sit where there would be space. Sometimes it might be at the back. Sometimes it might be around the center. He would sit where there would be space. He would sit with someone needing help until their due was met. We talked about the woman with mental illness sitting with them until they are at least uh, their needs are met at least to an extent. Uh, not leaving anyone empty-handed. It was a it's related that uh, no one came to the Prophet Sallam who was told no or refused anything. So he made sure that even if he couldn't give them something, he would give them some kind of credit that he, he made a gathering such that everybody felt equal. Everybody felt like they were a valued participant. He wouldn't dominate the space and try and own that space. He would be someone that would lift up everybody's voices, that uh, the gatherings were one in which elders were shown respect, young, the young people were given mercy, and a preference was given to those who were in need, uh, and as well as to those who were strangers to give them uh, the center stage. That his character had one in which there was never a time that he would say oof, or he would say fee, or just something that he would uh, say a harsh word. Um, you know, we have different uh, ex expletives in our society for these things, but he would never uh, be seen saying something like that, the, a, a word of negativity to that extent or kind of expletive, that he never struck anything with his hands. And that includes people, that includes human beings. He never raised his hands or hit any of his wives, any of the children, anybody like that. And he never struck anything uh, with his hand, except for the fact that if it, if it was in war, if it was in battle, and then he's holding a sword. So of course that logically is there, but he would never strike anything, strike anything with his hand. He never exacted revenge of personal injustice done to him. He never stored anything for the next day, that he would just take what's today's and just continue with that. Uh, that when he was given a gift, he would reciprocate it. So if someone would give him a gift, he would be sure to reciprocate that gift and give them a gift as well. Uh, and then, like I said, uh, the companions related that there was never something he would be asked for which he would not give, or there was never a time that someone came to the Prophet ﷺ and he would say no, even when he had nothing, because it's not a throne room, this is not a king, he would not have much. And so when someone came and asked him for something, uh, he would want, he, want, he had uh, one incident related that go to that market or whatnot, that's something you need, purchase it and say that this is uh, Muhammad's credit, that Muhammad uh, will pay for you, the Prophet ﷺ will pay for you. Uh, pray for me uh, and put it on my name. So he would give people credit. And then we know how he meticulous he was about settling his debts. But uh, this caused a bit of an issue with his household that why are you giving all this money out to people who need it? Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're still also people in need. And the process of lifting up how important it is to be there for one's community, of course, taking care of your own family first and foremost. But as a prophet, some he he was basically the spiritual father to this entire city. So not leaving anybody without something that they took away. Lastly, uh, the Prophet, Sallam, as I mentioned and will mention again, was not a rich person, was someone who was in absolute poverty from the moment he had left uh, Mecca, from the time that uh, he had been deprived uh, from the year of sorrow, that he had you know, lost much of his business. He was now the Prophet of Allah. He had not had a, an income and you know, had traveled to Medina, uh, and he was, not, he was living on the margins. 
the Prophet was related that at times would be unable to find the lowest quality of dates with which to fill his stomach, that there would be times he would be wandering the streets just trying to find something to eat. Uh, his family, Aisha relates, that would remain for an entire month without sometimes kindling a fire and only would have water or dates to eat. Uh, that the companions mentioned that when they were working, sometimes they would show their hunger to the Prophet and the Prophet were hungry, and they would lift their stomach, they would lift their shirt up, and at that time, there's a practice of tying a stone to your stomach as a way to kind of quench your hunger to make it feel like you're, you're actually full, and the Prophet as well was like, man, that, 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 that's, uh, that's rough. And he also lifts up his shirt and he's got two stones attached to him and showed they, they see that he was struggling with them as well and sometimes even more so. Uh, we have a story of the process of which we'll conclude on here in which uh, it just kind of touches on that element that he was one time just kind of going out at a time that he normally doesn't uh, and he found Abu Bakr. Uh, and he said, Abu Bakr, what are you doing? He was like, I'm here for the same reason that you are. I'm hungry. And he was like, all right, you know, let's go see what we can find. And same thing he goes to, uh, he finds Omar. Uh, and he's like, Omar, what, what are you doing? He's like, I'm here for the same reason you two are. And so all three of them are hungry and are eventually welcomed into a companion's home who feeds them. And before the Prophet Sussam even lets them take a bite of anything, he recites a uh, verse from Surah at takatur that, uh, la tusaluna yoma anin that on that day, Will, you, will be recall, you will be called to account for these blessings. And he relates to his campaigns at that moment that Allah found us hungry and now Allah has fed us. He was like, so remember that. This small piece of food, some bread, some meat, you know, not, not a, a big feast by any means, but just something that found him there. And he told his companions, he was like, we're going to be called to account for even this. And so this was the character of the Prophet ﷺ, someone who was equally mindful. And the last thing I'll actually mention, I didn't have it written in my notes, but one thing I want to mention as well is that to the non-human society, to I'm talking specifically about the environment, to the animals, the Prophet ﷺ was quite sentient. We talked about uh, in, in the previous uh, session or session or two that the Prophet ﷺ was going along uh, for the conquest of Mecca and had appointed a companion to stand guard over a puppy uh, or over a dog uh, who was milking uh, her puppies. And so the companion was to stand there until the army went by and uh, was not to be disturbed. And so the Prophet ﷺ in multiple incidents engaged with animals to this extent that he was able to understand their feelings. He was able to see that something's wrong. He was he went by uh, a, a, a camel, um, you know, at, at, at one instant, and the camel uh, was was quite sad. And and the um, and the Prophet ﷺ goes to comfort it, and he kind of admonishes the caretaker that you know have fear with regards to these animals, these things which can't speak. Um, you know, you're you're not feeding this animal well. Like you know, it's its belly is swollen. Like feed it something well. Uh, so he would see that. Um, he would also see, uh, you know, in, in times when uh, his companions would, would also do something wrong. There was a time where an expedition was going and this bird was flying over the, over the, uh, over the, the contingent, over the army. Uh, and the Prophet Sassam says like, which one of you has taken like her, her eggs or her, her baby bird or whatnot? And one of the companions like, oh, I, I, I took this. And he said, Put it back. He said, go, go take it and put it back. Um, and so uh, you see the Prophet had this sentience, not just for, and this cognizance, not just for the human and the human condition, but for his environment, for things that weren't, ex for things that weren't living, but also things that weren't speaking, weren't, weren't human in that sense. And so uh, I hope that uh, what the example of the Prophet shows us is not so much a, a, a character, an individual in a history book who we will never be able to uh, embody or ever be able to live up to, but someone, uh, because they're a prophet and they're, they're at this regard, but someone who can show us how to be better human beings in our daily reactions, wherever we might be, if we're working at a veterinary clinic, if we are engineers, if we're teachers, if we're um, people who are looking for work, if we're uh, folks and families, any of these different stratas that the Prophet example is one that meets us where we are. Uh, and his example example is that that shows it there. Now, uh, I, I would like to just conclude with a short dua um, of this because the series has concluded and alhamdulillah, uh, it has been uh, a blessed experience uh, for myself. And I hope that for you all, uh, it is also a blessed experience. But the last thing we'll do is just 
close with uh, the durud um, because we've gone over today. Inshallah, if you have any questions, feel free to email those. Feel free to put those in the WhatsApp chat. We'll keep that open. Um, but today we'll close with the durud, um, invoking the blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu uh, as is said in the Quran, as in said in the Quran, that uh, send your blessings upon, send your, uh, you know, your salawat, send those blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as uh, Allah and the angels also do. And so let us close with a the durud, the invocation of blessing on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahima wa ala ali Ibrahima innaka Hamidu majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahima wa ala ali Ibrahima innaka Hamidu majid. I hope this series has been of benefit to you all. It will always be available inshallah on our YouTube and Facebook. But thank you so much for being a part of this journey. And I look forward to engaging with you all in the days to come that this is just a one uh, stop in the life of the process. I'm in learning about it. Uh, inshallah, we'll continue to do programs like this as we get to know the Prophet Sallallahu and as knowing the Prophet Sallallahu getting to know ourselves and in knowing ourselves, getting to know our Creator. So, Jazakallah Khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.